<laughs> There's my intro. Don't eat my ice cream. Shut up! What's up, guys? Kyle here again. Now I can't stop laughing. I want some ice cream. All right, so my girlfriend's upstairs listening to me do this whole video and make fun of me the whole time, so let's just get to the questions. But real quick, before we do that, a couple of guys mentioned to me this week that uh, they would be interested in hearing me do some lower tune guitar uh, portions in my demos just to show how things would sound and like drop. What are you doing? Why are you throwing carrots down the stairs? When I started out, I started playing in drop C because that's what all the hardcore bands were doing. Um, but really in the past three or four years, I've kind of migrated to standard tuning for pretty much everything. Sometimes I do drop D, but if you guys would like to see some like uh, C standard type riffs or like drop D type or drop C type riffs, um, I can certainly work those in. Just have a guitar on standby in one of those tunings so you guys can hear what the amp sounds like in a little bit lower tuning. I know a lot of guys already do that and E standard's kind of my thing. Um, and that's one of the things that sets my channel apart. But again, I'm doing this for you guys. So if you guys think it would be helpful uh, to hear demos with a lower tuned guitar for you know a few riffs, let me know. I'll definitely start working it in from here on out. So question number one comes from my buddy Steve, who's been dropping questions every week. I appreciate you, man. Steve asks, what's your most hated high gain amp and or your most hated guitar tone album? That was really hard for me to read. Most hated high gain amp. For the most part, it's always been the dual rectifier. Um, I've just never gotten along with it. I've said that a whole bunch of times in my videos up to this point. Just never really was the amp that I was looking for. It was too fat and flubby and I just like a really tight punchy tone. Um, not really into the huge wall of sound thing, although I do like my guitar tones that sound massive and I like clarity and a lot of the dual rectifiers don't have very good clarity. Now, with my recent purchase of a multi-watt dual rectifier, I actually think that thing sounds really good. So I would say three channel dual rectifiers probably up there with one of my least favorites. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones that I've like hated. I hated my Engel Powerball. That thing was like a fuzz machine. Even when I dropped uh, a 12 AT7 in V1, it just was so fuzzy and compressed. I just never liked it. So that would probably be number two on my list. Most hated uh, album tone. Man, off the top of my head, I don't really know. I mentioned Never Ending Game is one of the bands that I've been listening to a lot in the last couple of years. I love their music. I hate their guitar tone. It's like somebody just took all the high frequencies right out of it and made it sound like fat, nasally poo-poo doo-doo. So if any of you guys are watching, I'm sorry. I love your band, but I'm not a big fan of the guitar tone. All right, the channel for everything says, what are your thoughts on the Mesa Mark series? I recommend almost any of the ones that aren't the Mark 5 25 or 35. I know a lot of people are able to make them work. I just can never make it work for me. So I owned a Mark 4 very briefly and played a Mark 5 somewhat extensively because Derek Verici had one for a while when we first started Bushido Code. I have never been a huge fan of them, but I know that they are very sensitive to EQ settings. They're very tough to figure out. I spent a long time uh, messing with the EQ settings on my Mark IV and I could just never get it where I wanted. It never delivered what everybody said that they delivered, which were super tight, dry, articulate tones. Like mine, mine sounded like an older rectifier, but it was really weird in the bass frequencies. Like it was fat, but it was tight, but it wasn't. I don't know. I don't, there could have been something wrong with mine. All I know is I got a good deal on it and I didn't love it. So I moved it on, made some money and went to the next thing. So I am absolutely open to trying another Mark series amp here in the near future. I'm actually going to try to get a Mark V or a JP2C on here. Uh, I'd be open to trying a Mark IV. I almost bought one a couple weeks ago. Um, it would be really cool to get something like that on here because I'd love to experiment with it now and see what I could do with it and obviously make another cool demo for the channel. So I personally, my experience with the Mark series hasn't been great, but I'm always down to revisit something, especially if you guys request it, no doubt. Austin Eldridge asks, how long is your honeymoon period with new gear? Thanks for the question, Austin. It really depends. I have gotten to the point where I don't even really get excited about gear anymore because I have bought and sold so much over the last six or seven years that it's like that excitement that you get when a new amp is in the mail or like, you know, you're going to pick something up and you can't wait to get home and plug it in. I hate to say it, but that's kind of gone for me because I've just done it so many times at this point that the novelty of new gear has worn off. 
I can usually tell right away whether something is going to work for me or not. The honeymoon period, I, I haven't owned a piece of gear in the last couple years where I loved it at first and then slowly started to get tired of it. I really just have gotten to a point where I'm pretty good at knowing right off the bat if something's going to work for me or if it's even close to being in the range where I could make it work and I could kind of, you know, figure out some settings and some tweaks to, to get it a little bit more to my liking. So I would say now the honeymoon period just doesn't really exist. Um, I haven't gotten a piece of gear that I've been really excited about recently that worn off and I was just like, oh wait, this kind of sucks or I'm over this. So in the past, I would get excited about everything, but I've never been a guy where as soon as I get a new piece, I'm like, oh, this is the next best thing. I, I feel like I've always been pretty honest with myself about the stuff that I get and whether I like it or not, because I, I want to like gear, but if I don't, I don't. And I'm, there's no reason to try and, you know, make myself like something that I, in reality, doesn't sound good. Being a habitual gear flipper and being able to make a couple bucks off of it when you sell things makes it really easy to justify not liking it because then, uh, you know, you don't, you're not that guy who has to justify his purchase of, oh, I just bought a Badlander for two grand and it sucks. But I spent $2,000 on it, and now when I go to resell it, I'm going to lose money. So it has to be good because I don't want to feel like an idiot for blowing my money on something that's, that I don't like. Luckily, I don't have that because I don't buy new gear for the most part. The only reason I bought the Badlander new is because of this channel. I knew I was starting up the YouTube channel, and I was like, man, that would be a really cool amp to do some of my early videos with. So um, luckily, I ended up loving it. So uh, yeah, honeymoon period for me with gear doesn't exist. I advise you guys to try and take all the gear that you get at face value and do the same, man. If you don't like something, just move it along for the next thing because there is a ton of great stuff out there right now. No reason to hang on to something you don't like or try to justify it to yourself. Christopher M says, Kyle, can you do an Archon versus the Bogner Ubershaw? Absolutely, man. I've been focusing on single amps lately, but I'm going to start getting back to the head-to-head -head videos because a lot of people like those and I think that they're helpful mainly in the way that you don't see amp demos in the context versus another amp that a lot of people are familiar with. So that's why I really want to do like dual rectifier versus an Ubershaw or a 5150 versus an Ubershaw or 5150 versus the Archon because you can hear an amp by itself and that gives you a really good picture of how it sounds. But sometimes when you stack that amp against something that you're more familiar with, you realize what you don't like about it or what you do like about it or how much drastically different it's going to sound than something you're used to when you can't really get that picture when you're just hearing the amp on its own. So I'm going to start getting to more of those. I just have so many amps that I'm trying to get through right now that I've been trying to make you guys a little bit more aware of what I have. That way you guys can request what you want to see uh, on the channel, especially for the head-to-head -head videos. You know, what do you want to see compared? So yeah, I'll be doing a lot of videos like that soon. Roland Garcia asks, have you tried EQs in the loop of amps? Uh, yeah, I absolutely have. I have an MXR 10 band EQ and I've got a little Chinese six band EQ that I throw on my board uh, every now and then. I don't use them often because I typically like to try to keep things simple. I like to have a pedal board out front and not have to run an extra two cables to the back of my amp, but I'm not against the idea whatsoever. I actually think that they can make a massive difference and in the near future, I'm going to make a video just showing how much you can shape your tone with a 10 band EQ in the loop of an amp. If you don't like an amp or an amp is kind of close to where you want it, you can really get it right there with a 10 band EQ. Now, I'm a little bit of a, a tone tweaker, so I tend to adjust dials if they're there even if it's not necessary. I'll play for a couple minutes and I'll be like, hmm, I wonder what if I did this? I wonder what if I did this? And the less controls that I have to mess with, the more I focus on actually playing the amp and enjoying what's there. So unless I don't like an amp or unless it's inherently missing something like the Mesa Stilettos, those are great amps. They have no low end whatsoever. So that, in my opinion, to sound good needs an EQ in the loop or else it just sounds way too thin. You can use that to your advantage, absolutely. It's a great tool to shape your tone if the amp is missing something that uh, you can't add without putting an EQ in there. Otherwise, I try to stay away from them just because I like to be able to naturally tweak the tone with the controls on the amp and not have to worry about any outboard stuff other than a boost out front. 
Uh, another question here on the Mark series and the Triple Crown amps from Sven. Um, the Triple Crown, I got one from Guitar Center two days ago for 1200 bucks, and they canceled my order. I was so disappointed. It was a TC50. It was in perfect condition. It was $1,199. I bought it. They sent me an email literally 15 minutes later saying, sorry, we got to cancel your order. Somebody bought it in store today. So I was really disappointed. If you guys see a good deal on a TC50, please let me know because I'm trying to get one on the channel ASAP. Uh, I've never played one. I really want to try one. I'd love to shoot the 50 out with the Badlander because uh, a lot of people have asked me about that. So yeah, if you guys see a good deal on a Triple Crown 50, I'm talking under 1500 bucks. Let me know. I will buy it immediately and we'll get it on the channel here. Unfortunately, that's my only thought on the amp because I've never played it. Uh, Luke Wilson asks, favorite speaker, do you mix them all the same? Favorite cab and cabs you'd like to try? And he has Omega in parentheses. I would love to try an Omega cab. Trust me. I just can't at this point with 16 4 by 12 cabs, I can't justify paying 1300 bucks for another cab. But in the future, I will. I will definitely grab an Omega cab because I hear nothing but awesome things. As far as speakers... My favorite speaker, even though I record everything on a Vintage 30, I actually like G12K100s and the old G12K85s more than I like V30s for most amps. I think it's amp specific. Certain amps benefit from the upper mid bump that the V30s have, and I think that's why they're so popular for metal, and that's why they're so popular for recording, because they sit where they need to sit in the mix. Now, when I am playing a Marshall-based amp, Usually, you don't need that upper mid spike. Um, so the G12K100 is a little bit more balanced, and it's also fuller in the low end, and a little bit, and I would say a little bit punchier. Um, I wouldn't call it tighter, but that full end is just bigger, and it it's very percussive. So I've told you guys my favorite cabs that I own are my Marshall Mode 4 400 cabs with the G12K100s in them. They complement like a Splon perfectly, an amp that's already... Got a big low end, but has a massive bright upper mid range. So I don't need to pair that with a V30. That's actually one of the few amps that I prefer to not put with V30s because it just gets to be too much in the upper mid frequencies. And the K100 sound great with those. The K100 also sound great with 5150s. I really would like to get the, uh, I haven't even played my Badlander through a mode four cab yet or a K100 cab at all for that matter. So I'd really like to try that out with one of those. So yeah, I love the K100s. I love the Vintage 30s. I just got a pair of Creambacks in a couple months ago, but I haven't really played with them too much. I put them in my Splawn cab, so I've got V30s on the bottom and the Creambacks up top. I really need to break that cab out and actually start using it for a couple videos and maybe get a mic on the Creamback too. But yeah, K100s and V30s are my favorite speakers. I do have two Eminence DV77s on order though, so as soon as those come in, we're going to check those out too. D White asks, hey Kyle, how does the Deadwell Duality DX go with the EVH 5150 EL34 and Stealth? Also, what's your take on Randall Amps, Thrasher, Satan, etc.? The Deadwell goes great with 5150 stuff. Uh, I love the green channel on that thing to death. The gate on that thing works amazing. Sounds really good with 5150s. So to me, having a TC integrated preamp side and a TS9 style side, but I think it sounds better. It's got more output. It's a little bit punchier and clearer than a TS9. I would say that that duality is, is a no-brainer to put with a 5150 style amp, especially with the built-in gate. That thing can pretty much take over your pedal board if you're, a, if you're a gate and boost type guy. That's all you need. So that pedal's fantastic. My thoughts on Randall amps? I don't like them. Um, I have a couple Diablos right now. I've had a Thrasher 50 and a Satan 50 on multiple occasions, and I just didn't like them. Uh, I felt like they lacked character. and a lot of people gave me crap for this on Rig Talk when I mentioned it, but they don't have mids that sit or cut in a mix very well versus an amp like a 5150 that I'm usually fighting against in my other bands. So they may have mids, but they're not mids that cut in a band setting because I had the mids dimed on mine. Jason, my other guitarist who lets me borrow a lot of gear, he doesn't run his mid super high on his 5150 and tends to like K100 speakers over V30s. And he still was burying me. And then Derek, when we did uh, scratch tracks for one of the Bushido Code EPs, I used a Satan 50 that I had just because it was a convenient amp to carry around. And the scratch tracks, it was like my guitar disappeared. It was crazy. 
he was using his spawn, I was using that, and you couldn't even hear what I was playing until he cut out, and it had nothing to do with levels because our levels were matched. It was the Thrasher just didn't have the mids to go against those amps. So I also felt like they were a little boring sounding. They were kind of sterile. They didn't have a lot of character. You know, I might be offending a lot of Randall fans right now. This is just my opinion. I'm not saying they're bad amps by any means because they're not. They were well constructed for one. They sounded good. They just didn't have the frequencies that I am trying to hear in my ear in band settings. Alone, they sounded pretty cool. But every time I tried it in a band, it just never cut. I actually filled in on guitar for a band called Face Rec for a couple of shows, and I brought that Randall uh, 50 watt with me in a Deliverance 60. And after like two songs into our first practice, I was like, yeah, this Randall's not getting any use. We're going Deliverance 60. So not a big fan. Always down to try him again, though. Show me that beast said, what did your old lady think when you were yelling in the basement? I'm a weirdo and we yell at each other all the time. So she probably thought it was totally normal. See, she's yelling right now. All right, Louis the Fly asks, what's your opinion on 24.75 inch versus 25.5 inch scale? And have you compared a Schecter Solo 6 and 25.5 with a Solo 2 and 24.75 scale? Yes, I have. I prefer 25.5 inch scale at this point. I like the extra string tension. Um, it makes the guitar feel a little punchier and snappier in my opinion. Really comes down to the guitar, but overall I tend to prefer the longer scale. And that's coming from a guy who plays on Gibsons for the most part. I would really like to see a Gibson with a 25.5 inch scale, but because everybody who buys them are traditionalists and crybabies, we probably won't see that anytime soon. But an Explorer with a 25.5 inch scale, that'd be dope. As far as the Schecter stuff, um, I actually think the one thing that they had going for their single cuts, which the original Solo 6, the body shape's a little goofy, but I don't mind it. The Solo 6 II looks a lot better to me, but most of them got shrunk to the 24.75 inch scale. And I think that's kind of a bummer because I think one of the things that they had going for them was the 25.5 inch scale on a single cut guitar. At the time, nobody else was really doing that. So that's kind of why I gravitated towards a couple of Schecters because they had the longer scale and I liked the way that it felt, especially when I was tuning down. A lot more companies are starting to employ that scale on single cuts. I know Solar is one of them. So there's more options, but I would really like to see, I think the Hellraiser is still 25.5. Maybe a couple other models are, but a lot of them have shrunk to that 24.75 on their solo series. I would like to see them go back to the 25.5 because that's kind of what makes them special as far as single cuts with a little longer scale on them. Kay Stickle says, have you ever tried Motor City pickups? No, I haven't tried Motor City pickups, but I definitely would like to. The Detroiter, the Angel Dust, the Afyu, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, are all on my radar. They're all on my list to try. I love the hot rodded PAF thing, actually voodoo pickups. We're talking about making me a signature pickup, which would be literally a dream come true. That would be so awesome. And we're talking about doing kind of like a hot rod of PAF style. I know there's a lot out there, but I've got some special requests that I think would set mine apart a little bit. But anyways, the Motor City stuff sounds really intriguing. I know Dave Friedman speaks really highly of them. Uh, I think that Motor City actually designed or makes his pickups. I don't know if he's still doing that because I haven't looked in a while, but I know that they're like top quality stuff. So never tried them. I'd love to get some in here. Uh, Nick Harper says, which do you prefer a 5150 or a Mesa dual rec? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to a lot of, be a lot of comparison videos between the two. I own a 5150 and there's a dual rec for sale in my area for a good price. You guys know I'm a 5150 guy all day long. With the purchase of the new multi-watt, that's uh, swayed me a little bit to like dual rectifiers. But 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to pick a 5150 over a dual rectifier just because that's my style, fits my ear. That's what I kind of started playing when I got into gear about 10 years ago. And the dual rec has just never really done it for me until recently. So I will do a shootout between the multi-watt and EVH 5150 Stealth. And this weekend, I'm going down to Pittsburgh and I'm actually picking up a two-channel dual rectifier, which I haven't had in a while. So I'll shoot that out against the original PV5150 because that's kind of like, those are the two 90s versions. And then I have the two newer versions in the multi-watt and the EVH 5150 Stealth and kind of show you the generational change between the two. But I will absolutely do videos like that. I wish one existed because I always thought that the dual rectifier was the amp I wanted when I owned a 5150, and there were no good comparisons on YouTube at the time, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And then I got a dual rectifier, and I was extremely disappointed. So I would love to put a couple videos like that together to help people out. All right, last question is from eHawk42. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. 
but that's how I'm saying it. What amp do you like better? If 6505 or a first gen 5156L6 50 watt? I'm thinking of selling my 5150 due to the EVH craze and getting a 6505. Do you think that's a good idea? It really comes down to the person. Uh, me personally, I like the EVH stuff better because the blue channel on those things just sounds perfect to my ear. That's kind of what I've always wanted out of a 5150. It's a little bit clearer. It's more open. It can get tighter. The low end doesn't have that sag that the original 5150 does not. It's still a, a pretty tight amp, but like there is a little bit of sag and a little bit of bounce to the low end on the original 5150. So I just like everything that the blue channel on the EVH 50 watts have to offer. Plus, I think they're an awesome deal, especially if you get the one with the concentric pots. You get three channels. Uh, you can dial the gain and the volume differently on the green and blue channels with the concentric pot knobs and you with the concentric pot model. and you essentially have a very usable three channel amp where all three channels serve a purpose. I'm not a big red channel fan on those, but they don't sound bad. And the blue channel sounds amazing and the cleans on those are good. So I think they're just an overall better choice. And right now with the prices of PV5150 is going through the roof, it's ridiculous. The EVH models are the way to go like no question. So that's my choice, but uh, thank you guys. Another successful week. I think this is the most questions I've ever had, so I really appreciate it. I try to get to all of them. I'm gonna be doing a live stream tonight to reveal a couple really cool amps that I'm getting in the mail today. I'm actually really excited for a couple of them. Hope to see you guys there. It'll be probably around eight o'clock. I think I'm gonna do it. And uh, I'll just show you guys some cool stuff that I got coming up on the channel and answer some more of your guys' questions in real time. We can hang out. So appreciate everybody being here. Please, uh, down in the description, check out the affiliate links. Check out my friend's pages. I got Voodoo Custom Pickups down there. I've got Deadwell Duality, Derek Verici's channel, all sorts of cool stuff, links to my bands, all that stuff. Appreciate you guys being here for another week of questions. And please, get me some more questions for next week. Drop them down in the comments, and I will absolutely get to them. Thank you, guys. Kyle here again. We'll see you next time. And you didn't even get me birthday ice cream. You got cookies and cream. You got garbage ice cream. You probably dug it out of the trash can.